with thanks to my Patreon, Uncle Chop Chop. Thank you for supporting the channel. I am willing to bet you think you know the Steve Harris bass rig already, don't you? I have a feeling I've already done this video. Precision basses, marshals, yeah, yeah, that's a good start. However, today we're about to uncover everything Steve has ever used in Iron Maiden. The secret to his enduring legacy is about to be uncovered once and for all. Oh, Edward, old chap. I don't drink tea, I'm afraid. <laughs> Bugger off. <laughs> in this new and revised series of the Steve Harris bass rig, we take a look at every single one of the Fender positions used throughout his career. And not to forget the Lados, the Roadsters, the Heymans, the Thunderbirds, and the Rickenbackers. All that and much more to come. Stephen Percy Ari Harris was born on March 12th, 1956 in Leytonstone, Greater London. He spent his time growing up at his nan's house while his father worked as a lorry or truck driver and his mother looked after the household. Growing up in a musical household, Steve was exposed to different genres of music thanks to his three younger sisters and their friends. Like the Beatles or Simon and Garfunkel, which was frequently played in their home. Although Steve would admit he wasn't sure if he enjoyed music initially but soon became drawn to music as a whole. Steve Harris has always been known as an extremely passionate person. And before his musical career even started, Steve was heavily involved in sports and was an aspiring sportsman, playing cricket, tennis, football, soccer for some of y'all. However, his ultimate dream was to become a professional footballer, playing for his beloved local football club, West Ham United. But he realised early on it wasn't his true calling. Yeah, well, when I was about 14, you know, I was I travelled to West Ham. I was on their books for about six months. And uh, I don't know, I just got disillusioned with it, really, because, you know, from sort of this eye, I wanted to be professional football like most kids. And uh, yeah. when I actually got down there, um, I found it was too, I don't know, I didn't want to be that competitive and too serious. And just at the age when I wanted to start going out and meeting birds and meeting drink, women, drink, yeah. Yeah, and drinking with the lads and stuff. Around the age of 14, Steve started to buy his own vinyl records. His first purchase was a compilation of reggae hits that included songs like Monkey Spanner by Dave and Ansel Collins and Big Five by Judge Dredd. No, not that Judge Dredd. S6 on the dots, it's up with the cock, up with the cock, up with the cock, S6 o'clock, it's up with the cock. Steve would regularly visit a mate's house to play chess, a popular pastime in the East End, apparently. During which Steve would report to listen to some weird fucking albums, something akin to hippie music. But he soon caught an allure to this background chess music and asked to borrow some of his mate's collection, including Jeff Toll, Genesis, and Deep Purple. Go around with mates, play a bit of chess and that, and he used to put all these albums on, and I thought it was, I thought it was hippie music, you know, I was uh, not used to all this stuff, like you know, listening to the Beatles and things like that, and yeah. uh, I thought, you know, what is all this stuff? And, uh, he stuck it all on and I said, oh, I couldn't handle it at first. And he said, well, look, take a couple of albums on Jeff Hotel and things like that. Mm. So I borrowed them and uh, lo and behold, I got to come up to the stuff. And, uh, you know, I just really started wanting to hear more and more, you know, rock albums or whatever. And it sort of went from there. After listening to those, Steve had a moment of clarity, exclaiming, I've seen the light, man, and became fully immersed in the world of rock music. By age 17, Steve had caught the rock and roll bug and was in hot pursuit. Initially, he planned on taking a crash course in drums, but soon realised this wasn't feasible, as he didn't have the necessary space and it would be too loud in his nan's living room. Instead, Steve explains why he chose the bass in an interview with Tony Bacon. I really wanted to play drums originally, but there's no way. So I thought, well, next best thing is to play along with the drums. I'd always liked the beat and the power of the bass and drums. He continues, Somebody actually said to me, you've got to learn acoustic guitar before you can play the bass. That is not true, FYI. I didn't know any better then, so I learned a few chords on acoustic. Got fed up with that. Thought, well, this isn't getting me anywhere as far as the bass goes. Steve then went out to buy his very first bass, a Shaftesbury copy of a Fender Telecaster, purchased for £40 in 1973, costing you $850 or £672 today. Side note, this quote can be found in both online and print with many different variations that aren't quite correct. Take a look at the show notes for a full list of all the bastardizations I found of this quote. Upon picking up the bass guitar, Steve immediately knew he found his true calling, exclaiming, once I got my hands on the bass, something just clicked and I knew I could do it. It was like learning chords, just hit the strings, you know, 
and it was wonderful. I just immediately got into making these really weird sounds way down low. And I think bass is just easier to pick up than guitar. After just 10 months of play, Steve had already traded his Telecaster copy for a Heyman 4040 and influenced some friends to start a band called Influence. This group soon renamed to Gypsy's Kiss shortly thereafter, preferring a name a little more upbeat and entertaining. If you know, you know. The band played three gigs around London's East End before breaking up due to musical differences. This picture of Steve playing the Heyman 4040 is believed to be one of the very first photos of him playing bass. It was taken during a rehearsal with Gypsy's Kiss in 1973 or 74. Being a massive Genesis fan, it isn't hard to believe Steve was inspired by Mark Rutherford to try the Heyman. Speaking of inspiration, Steve would also share that he explored and tried out loads of different basses, such as a Rickenbacker after Chris Squire from Yes, and a Gibson Thunderbird on the back of John Entwistle from The Who. I tried out loads of different basses. I had a Rickenbacker for a while. I had a Gibson Thunderbird. You tend to try different guitars like that because of people you like. Because some of my favourite bass players all were playing the same bass, Gibson Thunderbird, like Entwistle had one, Martin Turner had, had one, and so did Pete Way, and they're all totally different styles. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try one of them. Worst thing I ever did. <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was hanging this way, so you'd have to hold the thing up like this. It was top heavy, and it sounded terrible. So maybe it was just unlucky the one I had, I don't know, but I, you know, I was influenced by them enough to buy that guitar thinking it was going to mm. sound. If they can get those three different sounds out of it, maybe I can get something different as well. And no. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, Steve was unconvinced and shared that all these basses had totally different sounds. And I thought I'd try them out because I really liked their playing and their sounds. But when I got one, I hated it. It was horrible. It just didn't work for me at all. Now, I've never come across photos of Steve playing these basses. But if you have, you need to show me. Deal? Deal. Steve's next move was to join a more established and mature band, which he could learn from and progress his musical career. He found Smiler, a group that performed blues covers of bands such as Savoy Brown, Wishbone Ash, and ZZ Top. An audition took place at a pub called The White Hart in Enfield, North London, in February 1974. Successful in the audition, he got the gig and soon began writing his own music alongside his bandmates. However, when Steve presented the would-be proto Iron Maiden tracks to the group, they showed little enthusiasm, citing too many time changes. Steve took this as a sign he needed to form his own band, with the freedom to fully explore and develop his own creative vision. They liked some of the stuff I was writing, but it, it was quite a lot of time changes. I, I was trying to sort of get more progressive influences in there, and they were really more into sort of, uh, you know, sort of straight R&B stuff. And, um, you know, so it started to cause a bit of a problem. So I thought, well, the only way I'm going to really be able to write, carry on writing and doing, you know, I was starting to write more and more. And I thought, if they're not going to want to do me songs, then I'll have to leave and form my own band. According to the official Iron Maiden biography, Run to the Hills by Mick War, more music was written alongside a search for bandmates into the winter of 1975. And by that Christmas day, Iron Maiden was officially formed. Or born, depending on your spiritual choices. I'd have loved to have been at that Christmas dinner table. Mum, I've started the band. It's called Iron Maiden. The first ever lineup of Iron Maiden included Steve Harris on bass, Paul Day on vocals, Dave Sullivan and Terry Rance on guitar, and Ron Rebel Matthews on drums. This lineup were going to play their very first official show as Iron Maiden in early May 1976 at a pub called the Cart and Horses in Stratford, East London. This band's lineup underwent many, many changes that aren't particularly interesting nor relevant to Steve Harris and his bass tree. And it does go on and on and on. Let's summarise. People came, people went, and the lineup would be more or less established by 1980. Kinda. Until then, let's talk basses. I wanted to share something absolutely fascinating with you guys. Since this channel started in 2017, 85% of you that watch my videos has not subscribed. I have a favor to ask. If you enjoy watching my videos and you're looking forward to seeing the rest of the Steve Harris Bass Rig series, please can I ask you to subscribe. By and large, subscribing is the best way to support the channel. And if you do that, I promise to return a favor by bringing you the very best Bass Rig. How does that sound?
Introduced late 1975, early 76, a sunburst Fender Jazz bass was photographed during the earliest Iron Maiden shows, before swapping it out not long after for a Fender Precision bass. It's a natural fit, Steve Bean. I just found Precisions were best for me, and I still use them now. I really like the roundness on the bottom end of a Precision. I can get a real lot of top and real lows, the mid-range, everything, and all really solid. Steve's main bass has been and always will be a Fender Precision with a maple neck. It's a bit of a universal constant. His very first Precision, reported by Steve, is said to be an early 1970s model. Depending on the interview, Steve himself will date the bass from 1971 or 1972. While other sources suggest a manufacture range from as early as 1969 to as late as 1976. Recent fan evidence lean towards 1976, but this is still unconfirmed. To keep things simple, let's call it a 1972 model, as that date seems most consistent from Steve and press interviews. Is there anything special about this the guitar? Um, well, yeah, probably because it's probably done about every Iron Maiden album. Wow. Ever done. It's been about three different colours. It started out as white when I first got it. Then it was black, then it was blue, and now it's uh, the best colours it could be. As Steve says, the bass started its life painted in white, but the first time we see it is painted matte black. The bass made its initial appearance in a photograph during a rehearsal in 1976. Recorded throughout Iron Maiden's discography, this legendary bass has been a constant companion, enchanting audiences with its ever-changing colour palette and mirrored pickguards. Additionally spotted in the back of this rehearsal photo, we can see Steve's earliest choice of amplifier. It's a solid state, high watt, NCA 108 rated 100 watts at 8 ohms. Below that is a PV Mark IV. No points for guessing what the amplifiers are running into. Marshall 4x12. This simple setup was used during the pub circuit days and likely used to record the Soundhouse tape. Given Paul Diano's addition to the band in 1978, it is probable that the photo was taken no earlier than that year. In 1978, Iron Maiden faced the struggle of breaking out of London's East End circuit. Steve's solution was to record a demo tape at Spacewood Studios in Cambridge, 50 miles away from home, despite the higher cost. Steve insisted on quality, stating that doing it on the cheap was a false economy. Smart man. See, the big time A&R men would usually be found in central London, never daring to step foot into the bowels of the East End. Steve described it in Run to the Hills. We wanted to start branching out and playing gigs outside London, and there was no way people would take us just on spec. So that's when the idea of doing our first proper demo tape came up. Basically, we did it to help us conjure up a few gigs. Just gigging seriously in 78, 79. We were basically doing sort of, you know, the Arrow in Barking and the Bridge House, Canning Town and Cart and Horses and places like that, all these thing gigs. We couldn't get work outside really, you know. The band recorded on New Year's Eve 1978 for a reduced rate of £200. In a whirlwind session, they recorded Prowler, Invasion, Iron Maiden, and Strange World. The latter was dropped from the demo due to poor quality. Plans were made to return to the studio to remix and overdub the tracks. However, due to financial constraints, when they returned to the studio, they found the master tapes had been wiped. The next week we, we went back to buy the tape and the buggers had gone over it. So all we had was the quarter inch uh, tape. And um, that's what we actually ended up releasing the sound as. Uh, as. Steve eagerly pitched the EP to Neil Kay, a prominent heavy metal DJ who was in charge of London's most renowned heavy metal nightclub at the time. Although Kay initially declined Steve's invitation. He said, hello mate, we've just recorded this demo. Would you give it a listen and maybe give it a play? And I said, oh, you and Afterworld, mate. <laughs> you have to wait. He quickly realized its potential and featured the tracks during his sets. Consequently, the audience went nuts and the EP was christened The Soundhouse Tapes in homage to the club at night. Following the release of The Soundhouse Tapes, Iron Maiden gained the attention of a wider audience. Their energetic live performances quickly made them beloved and influential band in the new wave of British heavy metal scene. The Wobbum. Not long after, in November 1979, Iron Maiden gained a guaranteed three album deal with EMI. The band hit the studio that December, recording their first eponymous studio album, Iron Maiden. It was recorded at the time for £12,000 and released on April 14th, 1980. Steve Harris confirms in a Guitar World article that the main bass used in the studio was his number one 
70s era Fender Precision, before confirming its colour at the time was matte black. A clear view of the bass and Steve's amplifiers at the time can be seen in the very first music video, Women in Uniform. Ultimately, the main bass would keep its matte black finish from 1976 all the way into 1982. In the background of the video, some old school amplifiers are present and pad out some of the backline. Directly behind Steve on the right of the drum kit is a high watt NCA and DBX compressor. In this music video is the very first appearance of Steve using a DBX 160 compressor a device which has stayed in his rig ever since. To the immediate left of the drum kit is the PV Mark IV, and Dave's HH amplifier sits on top of Steve's cab. As this is a music video, I would speculate that the amplifiers are laid out in a symmetrical fashion. During the real shows, the HH amplifier can be seen in different positions away from Steve's usual cabinet spot. One more amplifier over and we have Steve's Sun Coliseum head. The diametric side of the sun looks like another HH head, but I can't say for certain at this time. The band embarked on three successful tours, including standout performances supporting Judas Priest and Kiss, cementing their status in the New Wobbum scene. During the British Steel Tour in March 1980, the matte black precision was the primary base used during this period. The stage setup included orange and Marshall 4x12 cabinets, which were interchangeable depending on the show. Acoustic brand bass bins sit underneath the orange cabinets and confirmed by the tour program. These cabs were powered by the aforementioned high watt and PV heads, as well as a new edition of the Sun Coliseum head. The accompanying tour program was printed long before the band even went on tour, appearing somewhat out of date by the time the band hit the road. Nonetheless, the program reports Steve using a Fender Precision and a Gibson Thunderbird. The program also refers to an unnamed slave head of 800 watts. Now, I have never come across Steve using a Gibson Thunderbird on stage. However, I can tell you with 100% certainty that Steve's backup bass on this tour was a Fender Precision in white with a rosewood neck. One of his earliest appearances is seen next to Dennis Stratton prior to his departure in October 1980. It was also photographed during Live at the Rainbow, which was recorded 21st of December 1980. The white Precision is reported to be a 1969 or a 1970 model. Many interviews favour 1970, and I'll be doing the same in this series to keep things simple. With the successful release of the Soundhouse tapes and Iron Maiden now to get you on tour, the Beast have finally found firm footing at becoming the Wobbin Masters. But they still had to record their next album, Killers! And that's where we'll pick back up for part two of the Steve Harris bass rig, kickstarting Killers and breaking down the Beast. In the next episode, we do a deep dive into all of the gear used to record Killers and Number of the Beast. We discover why Steve used an Ibanez Roadster and uncover his personal decorative homage affixed to his bass. Wait, what? Who could that be? If you're new here, you must subscribe and click the bell icon so you'll be notified when the next video is released. That's kind of how this thing works. The full show notes and a comprehensive list of every little thing Steve Harris has ever used during his career can be found in the links down below. That includes this video and all future Steve Harris videos to come. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in part two, kickstarting killers and breaking down the beast.